Hey everybody, thanks for joining me today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, in case you didn't know, today is an exciting day for our country and for the future of space travel. Today marks the first time in nearly a decade that American astronauts will launch into space from American soil. And that's a really big deal. NASA astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley will fly to the International Space Station on SpaceX's Falcon rocket with a crude Dragon capsule attached to the top. Now I'm sure a lot of people have been wondering what it takes to prepare for a launch and also why this day is so significant. I thought it would also be a good opportunity to bring some of my former colleagues together, a couple astronauts, a, a, a historic NASA flight director and space shuttle program manager who know a thing or two about what it's like to travel into space and what it's like to get a rocket ready to go into space. Um, so let me, let me start off by introducing um, the three individuals I have with me today. Uh, they are, I'm gonna start with Katie Coleman. Uh, Katie and I flew in space together. Katie's also one of the uh, few individuals who have flown in space with both uh, my brother Scott and I. And Katie has flown on the space shuttle, but also the Soyuz spacecraft. And then Dan Tani. Uh, uh, Dan has flown uh, on space shuttle, I think space, well, obviously space shuttle Endeavor with me in 2001. But I think you also flew on Discovery and Atlantis. That's right. Take, took off on Discovery, landed on with Atlantis. And then Wayne Hale, former space shuttle program manager and a flight director on my, was my ascent uh, flight director, Dan, for Dan and I in uh, 2001 on SDS 108 for Space Shuttle Endeavor. Uh, so let me, let me start with, um, with Wayne. And uh, let's start with a little bit about the historical significance of Americans getting back into space and also, Wayne, if you could explain a little bit of the difference between the space shuttle system and what SpaceX is launching with Falcon and Dragon. So it, it's, a, it's really a historic day because America has been without a way to send astronauts to low Earth orbit uh, or even beyond for almost nine years. Um, before that time, that's the longest gap since Alan Shepard first went into space in 1961 for the United States. So, so this has been a long time coming. We've been relying on our international partners, the Russians, uh, to provide transportation, and that's worked very well, but you would like to be able to do it on your own. And I think what's even more historic about this is this can be the start of a new industry. This is a new way to do business where the government doesn't own the vehicle, doesn't own the, the process, but is the buyer of the service. And the companies that provide that service can then sell tickets to other people that will allow, we hope, um, better economy and more business to actually take place in space. Thank you, Wayne. So Dan, so right now the crew is there in the morning uh, and just leading up to the few hours before liftoff in a brand new rocket. What do you think Bob and Doug are thinking about right now? Well, you know, we have the pleasure of knowing Bob and Doug and uh, they're uh, pretty uh, laid back, but, but obviously very focused. Uh, I'll bet they're having a great time today. You know, they've done uh, TCDT, they practiced uh, this launch day. They uh, should know this uh, rocket in this spacecraft inside and out. You know, they are, the, those procedures are, are just locked into their brains right now. And, and it's a time, I remember, Mark, you and I had our first flights together, uh, our first flight together on Endeavor back in 2001. And, and um, I remember launch morning for us, we, we woke up and, you know, had our breakfast. But then, uh, you know, we went to a weather briefing, but I remember you and I drove out to, uh, on the Kennedy Space Center, there's a sign that says, how many days to launch? And, we took pictures next to the sign that said zero days to launch. And I remember it as a really, uh, 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 not, not particularly nervous, but really exciting time. You know, you, you, they, these guys, and we had thought about that moment for years and years, and uh, that time was coming up. So uh, I think that they are, uh, obviously, they're, they're, they're mentally locked in. Uh, they're really excited to, uh, to uh, get going, and, and probably right now they're, 
suiting up or uh, on their way out to get strapped in. And uh, I'll bet everybody is, uh, is just really excited. So I remember that day well. I don't remember that picture, so please send it to me. I'd love to have I it. I will. I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Um, Katie, of the four of us, you are the only one that has flown both, both on the space shuttle and on a more traditional kind of rocket, the Russian Soyuz. And from my understanding, my brother having flown on the Soyuz too, you know, for, for liftoff, it's, there's some similarities, but the differences come in when you're coming home. Uh, so we don't know when Bob and Doug are going to be coming home yet. They actually don't have a end of their mission. It's uh, kind of an open-ended thing. It might be a month, it might be three months. Uh, but can you describe from your own experience a little bit about the difference between launching in a spacecraft like the space shuttle and what it's like to launch and land in a capsule like Dragon? Well, you know, the, the biggest difference in, and you've got a, a, the space shuttle there right next to you is that, you know, we use all that fuel, the little white rockets and the fuel tank. I mean, we use all that fuel on the way up but we're actually wearing our own protection on the shuttle. You know, the foam and all the um, insulation and everything. But then in a rocket, what's happening is, is your capsule is actually inside like a, a, a can. You know, that's your protection and you don't lose it until way after you've left the earth and you're getting to orbit and that's when you sort of shed that shell and can finally look out the window. So that's a really big part of it. And then by definition, the rocket is just physically smaller. And I remember launching on the Soyuz and it's, I think you can just, it's like you're wearing the Soyuz, you know, it's, it's like you just like put that on like a coat and, and, that, and those seats are small and we're all pretty close together. And so you could just feel every single bit of that, of that thrust, you know, leaving the launch pad. And, but the best part for me that was really different was, um, you know, in the early shuttle mission days, you know, STS-1, Bob Crippen, John Young, two people were in that space shuttle. But pretty much we have, you know, five, six, seven folks. And so there, there was uh, Paolo Nespoli from Italy, Dimitri Kondratiev and I in that tiny little Soyuz, which is the size of a smart car. And that was back in the days when we would take about a day and a half, almost two days of going around the earth, you know, about 16 times a day. Um, and just in our little spacecraft, just us. And we also also have like an attached kind of living room. Because I mean, like we have two smart cars together once we're up on orbit. And getting to be just three people circling the Earth, that was the most remarkable and special uh, part for me. And, and that's what made reentry special as well. Actually, your brother described uh, reentry for us where the crew that is leaving the space station back on Earth, he, he was the crew that was already there when we got there, they leave and three more come, now we're a new crew. Well, Scott, before our landing, said, okay, you, you should really understand what, you know, let's think through landing. I wanna describe every bit of it to you so you know what to expect. And it, at first it was hysterical, okay? Because he was like, it's like the e-ticket ride. It is like the best amusement park ride and the worst you've ever been on. And he talked about how, you know, remember it's made to do this, but you're gonna see pieces of burning spacecraft go by the window and that's okay. Yeah, he, because that is actually how that go ahead mark he says it's like uh, going over niagara falls yes. in a barrel but while on fire <laughs> and then when you realize you're not going to die it's the best experience of your life you unlike, know I unlike, have... this, unlike this yep. guy that if it's all done right and the commander does a good job you touch down in a smoother landing than you'll get with with any airline commercial airliner yeah and so is landing in solid. I had forgotten that Niagara Falls part of that, but you know, every bit of that um, description was actually great. And especially you talked about parachute opening shock, because you know, you're coming through the atmosphere and then now you're getting closer and closer. Those parachutes come out and he, and he looks at me, looks me right in the eye, you know, and he goes, Katie, you have to not be talking when the parachutes open. Okay, because you will bite your tongue. <laughs> And which is really true, but that's when you're like spinning and swinging and it's pretty amazing. But it is nice to have a heads up. And yet, you know, all these things work. They're all ways to space. And that's what we're all of us are about. And I'm just really excited about, you know, today, hopefully, we're going to see folks launching and a whole new capability to launch more folks up to the space station. So I want to get back to Wayne for a second here, based on what Katie just said. So this is a new capability today to get folks to the International Space Station. But we wanna to go to the moon. 
And what kind of, what, what different capabilities will we need in the system to get to the moon and then ultimately to get to Mars compared to what the current Falcon Dragon combination gives us? So, so what we've got in, in the Falcon Dragon and also the, the Boeing uh, spacecraft online in some months is a taxi. It gets people to and from the space station. It doesn't do all the things that the uh, shuttle used to do. It doesn't have an airlock. It doesn't have a robot arm. It doesn't carry uh, incredible amounts of cargo and on and on and on and on. It's a taxi. And, and the, the really nice part about this taxi is it's cheap and low cost and, and presumably reliable and as safe as it can be. Um, and what that does is it reduces the pressure on NASA's budget so that they can spend their money on the deep space exploration. So to go to the moon, you've got a spacecraft that's capable of spending much longer time in deep space. You've got to have a lander. You've got to go down to the surface and you've got to get back up. Everybody that's, you know, uh, looked at the Apollo missions, uh, we had the, the anniversary, the, the 50th anniversary last year, knows that there are all these you've got to have. Uh, and if you want to go to Mars, then you've got to be prepared to go on a voyage that's probably three years long. So you've got to have the living quarters and wherewithal to survive for three years coming and going to go to Mars, plus that lander and all the other things you might want to have, spacesuits and so forth. Yeah, that is going to be a amazing trip. I am so jealous of the first people that get to do that. Would love to do it myself, even though it is uh, a long time. I don't, I'm not so sure uh, my wife, Gabby Giffords, would allow me to go on the three-year trip, but um, I, 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 uh, I look forward to seeing that. So, Dan, you flew in space for a long period of time, but I think one of the things that was interesting about your flight to the space station is it was kind of unclear, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was unclear, like, exactly when you were going to come home. And I know folks are uh, spending, a, spending some time now in their houses with uh, quarantine. You know, some people might feel like it's locked down because we're dealing with a pandemic and it's, these are challenging and they could be stressful uh, times and a little bit of uncertainty there. And you had to deal with a little bit of uncertainty in space and also some stress too uh, during your uh, shuttle flight or your, during your space station flight. So can, can you describe what that was like and maybe some of, the, some of the things that individuals could do and try to focus on to get through challenging and unexpected times like this? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, my, my planned uh, flight, my planned mission to the space station was only for two months. And uh, because it just happened to be, I was up and down on the space shuttle and uh, many factors place a launch, a space shuttle launch. And so it just happened to be a pretty well, short duration between those launches. And what happened was the shuttle that was gonna come and pick me up had some problems on the launch pad that it took a long time to fix. And it turns out it took two months to fix those uh, problems. And uh, so that extended my mission duration from two months to four months. Now, I actually consider that a blessing uh, once you're in space, uh, there, it, it, there's, uh, it was hard for me to, to want to come back down, uh, especially after a couple months. And so um, I really uh, got to cherish uh, the, 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 the longer amount of time. But you're right, as they fixed these problems, these were pretty significant problems that required getting into the guts of the, the tank and the shuttle and, uh, and fixing some wires. And uh, so there was some uncertainty with the, what, if this would take weeks or months or longer to fix. So there was some uncertainty, but in the meantime, you know, I was really enjoying my additional time in space. Now in that period, in that extended period, sadly, I lost my mother, which was a, obviously a tragic thing to happen and, un, and unexpected. And, uh, and so that added some complexity to my time in space. And it made me think about, you know, being so far away, sort of metaphorically, we were only a couple hundred miles away, but, but unable to, to come home. But uh, my feeling was that, you know, we, the space station, we're trying to learn how to live in space. We want to go to Mars. We want to do these things that are uh, big missions and that will take a lot of time. And, and life is going to happen. And this, this is going to happen to people that go to Mars. And there are going to be joyous events in their lives that they'll miss and tragic events in their lives that they'll miss. 
And so I felt like, well, this is just uh, uh, an, an example of how we, the astronauts and the ground controllers and the families are going to have to deal with uh, this new era of living in space, which is exciting. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. The isolation thing is interesting. Um, what, what has really come to my mind, being isolated, we're, we are fully isolated, we're taking it very seriously, is that when we trained for a space station, one of the things that we had to worry about the most was if we lost all the computers and now the space station is spinning out of, not out of control, but, but not in a controlled manner and it can't talk to the ground. And there's a procedure, a very long procedure, where we have to basically reboot the, the, the space station. And one of, I remember in training, uh, that we talked about, okay, there's three of you on board, uh, the commander is gonna be doing this and this, uh, flight engineer is gonna be doing this, and, and the other flight engineer has to go to sleep. And you thought, what? What do you mean go to sleep? And the aha moment for me was, hey, in 12 hours and 16 hours, if we haven't reestablished communication with the ground, you're gonna have a tired crew. You want a fresh uh, mind up there. You want somebody who's on top of their game to pick up that procedure. And it's your job to go to sleep. And and I, that was a weird thing to think about. And now in quarantine or in isolation, I feel like this is our job. We are being asked by the world to isolate this virus, to make sure that we don't let the virus do what it wants to do and spread everywhere. And so it, it doesn't seem like it makes sense, but our job is to stay home. Don't talk to other people. Don't see other people. And I, that brings me right back to my space station training. It's, uh, you know, we got to think about the big picture. We got to think about what does the team really need? And honestly, the team needs me to sit home and not see anybody uh, and for everybody to do that. And, and then, uh, then we can figure out where the virus is, and pound it down where it is and, uh, and not let it uh, spread around uncontrolled. So it's really, this, this isolation period has, been, has really taken me back to that space station training. Yeah, I, feel, I kind of feel the same way. It's also about thinking ahead. You know, what right, exactly right, ahead? yep. The long, the long picture, right. Yeah, what, what is it gonna be like two, two weeks from now or two months from now? Uh, exactly let me go right. to a question I have from a teacher here in Arizona. And so, since this comes from a teacher, Katie, I understand that you now have a relationship with ASU, Arizona State University in Phoenix. Uh, I think you're doing some stuff with them. I don't know if it's exactly teaching a class. I am, uh, uh, I am actually their global explorer in residence who doesn't always wow. live there. <laughs> you know, it's actually a wonderful role in that um, it's a special place. I, and I know that there are you know, more than, there's more than one place in Arizona than ASU, but I'm, uh, I'm somebody who's just all about education and I really, I feel strongly about, um, they've got a mission statement where they're, they're very audacious, they believe in educating everybody. And sometimes to do the right thing, you need a catalyst to bring people together and look at each other and go, oh, we should be working together. And that's kind of my job there at ASU. Um, so this question, Katie, comes from Sandy. She's a teacher in Flagstaff. Okay. As a teacher, when I'm getting ready to begin the semester, I start having weird teaching dreams. Ooh. Do you have any weird or stressful dreams leading up to a launch? I think that, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it dreams, but I, I think you process a lot when you're asleep. And, and sometimes the right thing is, you know, you've been working and trying to fit a bunch of jigsaw pieces together or, you know, set in your mind what you're really doing on this procedure. On one of my missions, we launched the Chandra X-ray Observatory you know, big x-ray telescope, $2 billion, um, almost. And, uh, and I think that you get some of that stuff kind of sorted out. You sort of separate the forest from the trees when, when you go to sleep, and that's really helpful. Um, I do remember being on the space station and actually dreaming uh, often in, in zero-G and coming home and doing that as well. So it was, I don't know, it was sort of sad when I stopped dreaming in zero-G, when I really realized I was, I was home. Again, I, I completely think. agree with that. That's a bummer that I can't dream in zero G anymore. My brother wrote down his dreams. I think he may have told you this, Katie, when he was in space for, a, for his one year mission, because people would ask him after his six month mission. So, he, so during the one year in space, he wrote down his, some of his dreams and they were crazy. You know how everybody, you, you kind of have crazy <laughs> dreams. So he, he, he has a, has a uh, accounting of what he was dreaming in space. It's interesting for me, I think the entire time that I was an astronaut, I never had dreams about space. It's only after I left that I started having dreams of like flying the space shuttle or getting ready to go into space or come back, but never when I was there, strangely. Well, you know, we're pretty busy. I mean, it's hard for people to realize how busy it is 
up there, except I know Wayne, I, Wayne's looking at us like, I know how busy you are. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody designed that plan, and it was it was our team that designed that plan. Um, but uh, the way, just the way of life, and and what we accept is kind of the new normal. But these, it's getting back to what Dan said, you know, about sort of isolation and and social distance and things like that. Is I, I tend to think that maybe astronauts and flight directors and and people who are explorers. I mean, so that's really the whole exploration team um, are very accepting of a new normal. Like we've decided we're going to go to a place where there's not gravity and we're going to get stuff done. And, uh, and so I, I like that accepting of the new normal, but something uh, actually that relates to you and your brother that um, happened to me is I remember, and you just accept actually a sort of like almost European distance between each other where you're just, you're just a little closer because you, it's, it's loud up there with all the fans and stuff like that. And I was used to, I was with your brother for about four and a half months up there. And then your crew came, he'd have gone home, your crew came up. And, and I remember, you know, suddenly finding myself sort of right next to you. And, and you looked at me and I looked at you and I go, you are not Scott. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear what Wayne has to say about what, you know, we're telling these space station stories. These, I mean, on orbit, it can be shuttle, it can be station, but... Tell us, give us a view into what it sounds like, what it feels like on the ground when, well, when you can tell us everything to do and, and we don't always do it. Well, yeah, there is always that. It's a little bit like feeling with children and that you tell people what to do and they don't always do it. I mean, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I have the greatest admiration for the crew, but the flight planners were always trying to put just one more thing in the plan. Can't they squeeze in five more minutes to do this extra experiment or something like that? And so uh, we had a struggle at the flight director's console sometimes to decide what needed to, to go in, or maybe we had overstressed people. I will tell you that my pre-flight dream was always about uh, somebody not doing what they were supposed to do. And that could be on the was ground. It, was it Mark? Yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I, I have some candidates. Oh, wait, Wayne, I'm curious. Did you ever have a crew revolt against you in any way? You ever feel no. like that happened? No, no, not at all. No, we never had that. We worked very hard, I think, to try to to build that uh, spirit of core where we were all on the same team. And um, you know, is any situation where you're at a distance, um, communication can play a role, and, and you have to really try hard not to get your wires crossed and, and miscommunicate and things so uh, but we we really tried hard i think if you have to, you have to go all the way back to skylab or something to find a, a place where the crew really didn't do what uh, what the mission control told them to do and i, and I really don't blame the crew for that that was more mission controls part so we learned a lot over the years we really did hey dan i got a question here from a six-year-old for you and his name that's is right Pat. that's right at my level <laughs> it's a it's a good question he wants, he says, how will the rocket ship be launched into space? And while he's asking this, by the way, he, picture him, he's jumping up and down with excitement just to ask <laughs> this question. But so why don't you, uh, just so he understands, how does a rocket ship work? Yeah, it, well, okay, so the jumping up and down is good, but the, the way to think about a rocket is uh, think about if you're on ice skates and you have uh, uh, heavy bowling balls or cannonballs and you throw, the, the bowling balls while you're on ice skates and then you're going to move the other way. Then the harder you throw those cannonballs, the faster you're going to move on, on your ice skates. And that's how rockets work. They take stuff, the propellant, and they throw it out the back as fast as they possibly can. And the, because that stuff weighs, has weight. And just like on you on the ice skates, it, it means that the rocket is going to go in the other direction. And the more stuff it throws, the lighter it's getting. And so when it throws stuff, and when you see those fires and flames coming out of the rocket, that is just all that stuff coming out is unbelievably fast. And so when he gets into high school, he's going to learn about the conservation of momentum, and he's going to find out that MV with a really big V means uh, uh, this big M can move at this V this way. And that's how, that's all, that's the whole secret of rockets is trying to throw stuff as fast as you can out one end so that you can get some velocity in the other end and that's a really good question from a six-year-old physics good physics. that's awesome physics. i learned something there too dan seriously <laughs> you know, we all have our different ways of explaining it i like that okay great i so demonstrated I when more... I, I, so i taught a little science in uh for a couple of years and the, and we did that with a, a, a an office chair on rollers and and basketballs and we 
we threw them and, and we, could, we could videotape it and we could do the momentum, um, the momentum, the momentum exchange and, uh, and prove to ourselves that that's how it works. So Katie, on, uh, I, I think I know the, 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 the answer from your experience. Well, I certainly know from mine. So this is from Patton in Queen Creek, Arizona. Okay. She wants to know, like on an airliner, do you all clap once you've reached orbit, like landing in a plane? Well, I'm going to say no. <laughs> Man, I think I remember giving you a high five <laughs> after Miko. Didn't we do that? What's that? Oh, yeah, I was going to say Dan. Oh, I thought you oh, said I me. I'm like, you, yeah. I asked you, Katie, and but I, I, I remember a couple high fives, not a lot of clapping, but. Well, and, and actually our, our flight, STS-73, my first flight, we had five rookies and two experienced people, and we slipped seven times over 30 days. And after a certain amount of time, you just start to realize that maybe people were just fooling you and you weren't really going to get to go. And so I remember when we, uh, we lifted off and there was hooting and hollering, and then there was a, there was a voice that said, settle down. <laughs> right. Well, this is a... Uh... This is a great day today, a uh, great day for NASA. It's a fantastic day for our country to be launching U.S. crew members from U.S. soil. Once again, it's been a long time since 2011. I'm really excited. Uh, I'm wishing these guys well. I'm sure all three of you are as well. And hopefully we can be doing this uh, more routinely, getting our folks up and down into space to the space station. And then let's figure out how to get back to the moon and onto Mars. So I wanna thank you for taking this time to join this, this uh, chat with me ahead of this historic launch. And um, to Doug and Bob, I know you're probably not gonna see this, but if you do have a great flight, don't break the space station and we are all really rooting for you. And uh, to Katie, Dan, Wayne, thank you so much for joining today. Really thank you for having me. Thanks, Mark. It's been a nice real pleasure. Nice to be together. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to see everybody.